Present. 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 Here, um, I don't know if um, anybody else is getting, anybody else is getting the feedback that I'm getting back that I'm getting. I am, and it, it looks like it might be coming from Brazil's. There we go. Yeah, you're not speaking. If you could mute, uh, I think we're just catching the feedback on some old different channels. Okay, Labor Representative Norton. Labor Representative Norton. I see you there. I'll count you present. Labor Rep is here. It's it's going back. The volume. Is, oh, it's terrible. Can't hear anything. Okay. Thanks for your Jesus. patience, everyone. Uh, Mayor Roberts. Here. Thank you. Councilmember Schwedy. President. Uh, Council Member Wright is absent and Council Member Nearing. Here. Thank you. And for the alternates, uh, I see Council Member Gallagher. Yes. Here. So, uh, Council Member Payne. Present. Okay, thank you. Uh, that does conclude roll and chair. We do have a quorum of board members. All right, thank you very much, Rachel. Okay, for the public comment, we have a, one written comment which was received today from Joe Kunzler. It was provided to the board in advance of the meeting. Uh, we have a few people remotely who would like to address the board. Uh, we will start with, and when your name is called, please turn on your camera and your microphone if you can. Uh, we will start with Sabina Araya. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. My name is Sabina Araya, and uh, I worked for Community Transit for two and a half years in the service planning department. And I am here again, as I was last time, to um, request that you rescind the mandatory vaccination policy that affected our drivers and mechanics, um, or that you hire them back uh, with accommodations um, for those that were terminated for or medical reasons. At the last minute, uh, at the last meeting, you adopted a Title VI update to the agency's plan, uh, which provided federal mandated guidelines for public process and provision of service, both additions and service cuts. And um, I mentioned at that meeting that those guidelines were not only not observed in the March service change, but that there was a lack of transparency um, and the public awareness of the changes. The service cuts in March fall under the guidelines of the Title VI process, especially for the routes where service was cut by more than 40%. Those cuts were a direct result of this vaccination policy uh, implemented last September and effective January of this year. Um, and there's a couple of items on today's agenda to which this also applies. Um, the 2022 Transit Development Plan, you will see a draft um, out today, uh, public hearing and public comment to follow. Uh, when you are reviewing that plan, I am asking you that you please take a look at the fixed route service um, and planned addition and compare that to the 2021 approved plan from last year. And you will see a reduction in service for this year and through 2024. That growth um, approved, that approved growth in service in 2021 would have followed that trajectory had this mandate not been in place. Um, and there's another item on this agenda, and it's the uh, regarding the emergency authorization uh, resolution, uh, 1222. I do appreciate the fact that it includes um, a vetting, a, a vetting process by the board, and that is very much needed because I'm hoping that the lessons in how this policy came about is, was implemented will be useful in making different decisions. Um, the agency had from from the time this implement this mandate was implemented or it was um, put out there uh, in September, the agency had about three months to prepare for service cuts um, that would follow. Um, 
And in addition, another three months before March, when the, uh, the service cuts were implemented, um, and offer the public the chance to uh, mitigate service loss, um, ask them how, from what routes service should be cut. Um, by December, it was known that a percentage of service would be cut. And yet at the end of December, what the public was told in a December 26 article quoting CEO Rick Ilgens Ritz, uh, was that service would not be affected at all. A couple of weeks before the March service change took effect, the public was told that the trips would be cut to improve reliability. Um, there was no comprehensive survey, a summary that provided a count of trips cut. Um, so you can go by route by route and see the difference. Um, the agency went out to the public for a year and a half uh, when it added trips to the 800 series in last October and asked no questions when it removed the 52 trips in March um, without any public input, and that shouldn't be the case. It was also mentioned in March that the reductions in service are temporary, that service will be restored in the summer, and there has been no mention of that as of yet. We, it's already summer. Um, you had three months to assess the impact of the policy. The agency had another three months to involve the public and be transparent about both the cause of the service cuts and ask for input. The employees deserve better. Our public deserves equitable, equitable public engagement and honesty. And right before this meeting, I emailed you um, uh, the petition that was uh, a petition that was signed by over 70 supporters of our request. Um, I'm asking you again to please do the right thing. Um, and it is all way overdue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, next we have Shelly Schweiger. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, using my phone for communication. So my name is Shelly Schweiger, resident of Arlington. I was a union driver for 30 plus years for community transit and awarded 2 million miles of safe driving. I was one of 65 uh, community transit employees identified as having a religious exemption. And on December 31st, 2021, community transit terminated all 65 of us without accommodations. Unemployment approved my, um, through investigation, finding no fault of my own pertaining to the CT vaccination policy. Since then, I have learned the following. On May 11th, 2021, Governor Inslee gave job protection to high-risk frontline workers through HELSA. HELSA doesn't discriminate and supersedes all vaccine policies. CT wellness program identifies employee health conditions and injuries. And our CEO knows that employees qualify, you know what, what employees qualify for HELSA. CT religious employees were terminated with no accommodations. CT other transit base at Cash Park was not mandated, no vaccine required as a condition of employment. And Cash Park route, um, they pick up local passengers whose destination is Northgate and Seattle. No mask requirements and no vaccine requirement for those employees. I am back to urge you to hire back drivers and mechanics that were terminated due to the mandatory vaccination policy and help restore service that was cut in the spring. Regarding resolution 1222, the update to the emergency management policy, I'm glad to see that there is some language that allows the board to modify measures taken by the CEO under the provision. If you approve it today, please resend existing vaccination mandate and hire back the drivers and mechanics that were unjustly terminated. I would suggest that such policies should have some guidelines, especially when it comes to terminating employees, change in work conditions or service cuts that last longer than a month. There's no reasonable explanation for giving away your authority to vet decisions if they expand over one of your monthly meetings at least, decisions that take more than a month 
to implement and remain in place should be discussed and approved by the board. Since 1976, you've been board members. The mandatory vaccination policy is an example of why those guard, you know, guardrails should be, you know, put in place. The policy was implemented end of December and you had the October, November and December meetings to discuss its impact on employment and service and approve it. A six month timeline to service cuts that were a common sense re you know, result and a policy that resulted in 10% reduction in the workplace and service. That is not a true emergency that requires a solo decision by a CEO. The process should have been approved by you, the board members, because you are accountable for the policies you approve and you are accountable to the residents and to the federal government for agency, for the agency and its service now and in the future. The true emergency service and personal modifications of 2020 when the whole world shut down was completely different than the vaccine policy. The vaccination policy has no measurable safety outcomes and did absolutely nothing to pre in preventing COVID infections. On the contrary, COVID cases for half of this year far superseded all of last year. Objectively, the policy created a false sense of safety that allowed employees to disregard, disregard potential infections and go into the workplace and infect others. Such policies should be approved by you and should never be implemented without due process. And I am, again, reminding you that community transit service is operated directly and through contracted services. Contracted services is not mandating the vaccine for their employees, yet there is no, nothing different between the two groups of drivers for customers. You are effectively punishing community transit drivers by allowing contractors to not follow the same mandate. The same is true for transit police who come into contact with our public. No other transit agency in, in Snohomish County is imposing this mandate. We are consistent with no one in our country, in our county. I will also add that as an employee and member of the union, I am happy to see that other transit unions like Local 883 are fighting for non-discrimination for their employees and including no mandatory vaccine clauses in their contract. You heard their president provide comment at the last month's meeting in defense of our drivers and mechanics. I wish our union leadership would have done the same consideration for its members. This policy have ne should have never re <sighs> this policy should have rescinded when OSHA was stopped, when January COVID cases numbers came in, but it should have never put, been put in place to begin with on misleading data. We were told that the 23 cases in September, the majority were unvaccinated. Asking for the actual numbers now, the agency told me they don't keep track of that information. Internal sources told me that only three of those 23 were unvaccinated. This, that is no, by no means justification for improving safety with a vaccine policy. This should have never been implemented. We should have evaluated better safety measures like testing for everyone. Please rescind it as soon as possible and do the right thing by the employees and to have stood by you, you all board members for many years and get the agency back on track. That's all I'm asking. Thank you. Uh, Lillian Elmer. Lillian Elmer, are you on the line? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, all right. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Lillian Elmer. I'm 80 years old, and I was a driver for community transit for 20 years, and I've been retired for uh, several years. I work part-time for Metro and First Transit. Also, I was elected as secretary of the ATU local for uh, two terms, and at which time I participated in leadership meetings and attended some of the board meetings. I am here to voice my disappointment with the results of the vaccination mandate for the employees of Community Transit. As a consequence of this mandate, a devastating number of drivers and mechanics were let go as a result of Community Transit's mandate policy. How is an agency this size with a budget so large unable to provide accommodations to these employees? In effect, the policy removed a group of people that due to religious or medical reasons were unable to take the vaccine. To not find a way to accommodate them is going against any diversity standards the agency says it upholds. This is not how you value employees. This is not how I remember the agency being, and this is not an acceptable way in this day and age of doing business. My old friends and coworkers with tens of years of service being terminated for their beliefs and an uh, and ability to take a shot that is not a part of improving safety in the workplace. It is outrageous to lose these valued employees. To see service being cut as a result is heartbreaking. Every trip counts for someone who needs to get to a job or an appointment or to their home they purchase to avail themselves of community transit service. To hear that a policy has no measurable justification, that COVID cases are up, that even at the time of the implementation there was no data records kept on how many of the cases were unvaccinated employees is mind-boggling to me. On what basis do you mandate a vaccine if you don't know how many of the COVID cases were unvaccinated employees or that the vaccine prevented infection? How do you not rescind the policy as soon as more information is available that contradicts that inf other information? You have no data, no positive outcomes except more positive COVID cases, devastating effects on the workforce and and the service. Why are you keeping this policy in place? You, Community Transit Board of Directors, elected by the people of Snohomish County, have a responsibility to the public to ensure that these types of policies are scrutinized by you, are justified, and that the public can understand their effects on the service. It is way past time to rescind this vaccination mandate policy. Please do so. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Elmer. Okay, we also have uh, Peter Mycutt. I believe he's in the room. Hello, good afternoon. Is that just, well, you guys can hear me. Yeah. Everyone else can hear me? Um, <clears throat> nice place you got here. Good job. Um, yeah, I just wanted to elaborate on what's been said, <clears throat> given our observation report. And that's basically relating to a shifting baseline sy syndrome that's being created here. I uh, I noticed that since uh, the shakeup, I told you I was going to report on how things changed, that I understand that they're trying to cover the work on the weekends, reduce the drop trips. What I've seen now is it's just kind of like Moving the cheese, the mouse of cheese, we moved from the weekends to the weekday. <clears throat> Out of 25 reports, we're down to 20. Uh, the 20, <clears throat> excuse me, 16 of them, or 14 of them, are working the weeks, and six are working the weekends. But on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you're dropping two reports on Tuesdays and four reports on Wednesdays, and another two on Thursdays. And that shifts how the work is covered. So I'm seeing more drops trip. Now what the data shows versus the weekend and weekday, you're still dropping trips. That's still impacting the community service. Um, I see the pre uh, youth fairs coming up on reports. I'll pass on that. And just recently,
a driver was exposed and uh, had to be taken to the hospital for uh, being experiencing the fentanyl smoke that's being smoked on routes. And I'm understanding that, yes, Mark taking the security has taken a big step towards the weekend and covering that. But what's, again, it's shifting to the local routes. Like I reported last month, I was experiencing on the local route, um, the fentanyl use on my bus. And now just you know, a few days ago, a driver had to be taken to the hospital. I don't see where this mandate is working. I see that uh, people get COVID and die, people get COVID and live through it. People don't take the vaccine, get COVID, people don't take the vaccine and uh, live through it. It's interesting about the mission statement that comes up. What was uh, to provide a safe and reliable transportation each and every day has been changed to get people where they are, from where they are to where they want to go. There's no mention of safety. And now with safety being the most important thing now, not only with COVID, but just actually drivers uh, driving public, riding their buses. They're trying to get from where they want they are to where they want to go, but they're being exposed also to the fentanyl use. And it's not right. The numbers show to me that this mandate is not working. Like I say, people are going to get COVID. It's like the flu. It's been, it's out there in the in the news. I ask that you just go back to what it was in the beginning. Treat it like the flu. You get sick, you stay home. You get COVID, you stay home. You deal with your own immune system. Deal with the way you want. You want to take a shot, great. You don't know. It's a choice. This is America. The freedom to choose. And it, it, it's mind boggling to see other agencies not enforce the mandate, but this company enforces the mandate. And I'm really concerned as to what the intent of keeping this mandate in place is. I'll look into uh, that answer and hope that I can find that answer. From the CEO, and what his intent is, or somewhere else. Until then, I, I pray for all of you, pray for everyone that uh, we can get through this. But lift the man, bring the people back to the laid off, bring the people, let allow people to come to work in a place where they feel supported. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mike. All right, is there anybody else uh, online or in the room like to address the board? <laughs> move on with the Chair, we do have, it looks like two people. Uh, the first being Mr. Joe Kunzler. Hey, Mr. Kunzler. Hi, can everyone hear and see me? Yes. All right. I didn't want to speak today, but uh, unless we had a platooning of people who wanted to talk about why we needed a vaccine mandate. So here I am. I don't know if this is okay or not, but I'm going to share my um, screen. Um, this is, you are at eight times chance risk of dying from COVID-19 if you're unvaccinated and you're 1.5 times risk of testing positive if you're unvaccinated. This is not a game. If you, and, and I don't want someone dying in my name to tell me around, that's not what America's about. We're putting, we're asking these people to risk their lives and their health. Let me say it again, eight times, eight times the risk of dying from COVID if they're unvaxxed and they're sitting in a bus, the air is circulating. We just heard a presentation about fentanyl risk. Guys, hold the line. And when we're talking about holding the line, I got to bring this up because the hot mic's on and just so we can have the workshop focus on what's before the workshop later this month. Earlier today, the Sound Transit Board was able to hold the line against Alex Zimmerman. And you know how they learned how to hold the line? Because former board member Todd, former CEO Emmett Heath, and a very special public records officer who will not be named held that line. 
at Community Transit and passed the notes to me to pass the Sound Transit so that we could hold the line against Alex Zimmerman. And that's because of you free special dudes. And we owe you. And I feel an obligation to a special public disclosure team. And if I felt comfortable, I'd share their names, but I don't feel comfortable. So I'm just gonna say this. I know at least one a member of that team has got kids at home. I know another member of that team has to worry about their dad. And I ask that when you start considering this policy, you think of the families at home who have suited up and fought Nazis, Nazis to protect you, to protect your colleagues. I couldn't do what I do without them. And I'll say it again one last time, just so we are absolutely clear. This is from the covid.cdc.gov. Eight times the risk of dying from COVID-19 of unvaxxed. I don't think that's a risk we need to be taking. And I want to thank the board for giving me the privilege of speaking to you. It is a great privilege and an honor to have this remote technology. And that is because of the work of so many from the anonymous help desk to the public disclosure squad to the board support staff. And I just want to tip my cap to you. Thank you so much for having me today. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kunzler. And then uh, are you referring to Mayor Nering as the other? Yeah, okay, Mayor Nering. Thank you, uh, Chair Marine. Appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to those who have spoken today. Um, I've been, uh, I think, pretty clear in my um, disagreement with the vaccine mandate from the get-go. I've shared it uh, at board meetings and committee meetings and, and with CEO Elgin Fritz. I will say too, I, I wanna make a distinction. I, um, I do believe that Rick has, uh, uh, acted in, in good conscience. Um, I think that Rick has the purest of motives here. This is in no way a reflection of my, uh, of anything personal with, with Rick. Um, I have utmost confidence in him as our CEO, but I do feel, um, you know, the vaccine mandate, uh, has proven to be, um, ineffective. And I'm going to say, you know, I think when we're looking at this, we've got a hiring crisis all over the, the state, all over the country right now. We have a situation at Community Transit where we've got a similar situation, and we've just created a hurdle um, that is impacting that in a negative way. And the science has changed to the point where right now we don't, I, I have yet to see any science that shows where being vaccinated makes you less likely to infect somebody else with COVID-19. And I think that's really what's, uh, what, what, what's the discussion here. In other words, if you have the vaccine, like I do, I am vaccinated. So this isn't personal for me. I'm vaccinated, but I don't have a wall around me that if I catch COVID, which I have caught COVID, by the way, even though I was vaccinated, I was, uh, I was no less of a risk to anybody else than an unvaccinated person with COVID. Just by the fact that I'm vaccinated and have COVID, and somebody else who's unvaccinated and has COVID doesn't make me any less of a risk to those of you around me. So I'm not certain why we're insisting on continuing, and this isn't just with community trends, why, why we're insisting on continuing with a vaccine mandate that doesn't protect anybody other than arguably those who don't want to take it themselves. And that should be a personal decision, in my opinion. So I appreciate those who have spoken. I, I've been against the vaccine mandate uh, since it started, um, even though I am personally vaccinated, I don't think we should force others to be vaccinated. And I have yet to see any science that shows that vaccination prevents you from spreading the disease if you have it. And I think you could almost, in some ways, make a case that you're more of a risk if you're vaccinated, because like me, when I got it, I was like, well, is this allergies? What, what exactly is it? Because with the vaccination, I had a, a really mild case of COVID. I could have very easily just gone in and infected other people, whereas somebody who is unvaccinated might um, have more symptoms and be more likely to be very cautious and, and test more regularly and, and make sure they stayed home. So I wish there was, a, I'm not certain, I guess we'll discuss this a little bit later under um, the uh, proposed um, emergency policy. If there's a way for the board to vote on this, I, I do believe that would be the best route to take personally. And I uh, just wanted to express uh, those thoughts here. Thank you for indulging. All right, All right. is there anybody else online or in the room? Not seeing any there. their hands come up. Nobody's getting up in the room. So, all right, we thank all of you uh, who provided the comments.
Uh, all right, that takes us to our first presentation. Uh, CEO, and owner, if you have a, an, an honorable presentation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, everybody. We spent the afternoon here, the first part of the afternoon, on the tough part of the job. Now we get to switch gears to the fun part of the job. I'd like to ask Trent Botham to come up and join me at the podium. How's the audio? Good. Good. Rachel, Chris? Uh, we can hear you. Excellent. Excellent. Can. <laughs> well, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be joined up here today with uh, by Trent Botham. Trent is celebrating 30 years of public service. Uh, probably one of the first people I met when I started this job last January, um, I did a series of ride arounds my, my first month or two on the job and uh, Trent was the first supervisor I got to ride with. Uh, we, I think we rode the 202 back down from, from Smoky Point and he was showing me around uh, the north end of the PTBA and he was uh, describing to me uh, and helping me understand the critical role that supervisors play here at uh, Community Transit and delivering safe and reliable service and helping our operators out on the road. You can't hear me, can you? Okay, I'm too far from the mic. <clears throat> Subtle but effective, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, uh, Trent's done just a little bit of everything here at Community Transit. He started out originally as a coach operator, coach operator trainee, he drove buses, uh, moved pretty quickly into the supervisor ranks, and that's really where he's spent the most time. Uh, he, he has been a leader. Uh, helping mentor our coach operators, our dispatchers, and helping them figure out how to solve problems on the road, to be safe, uh, to step up and, and own their own performance and, and be the best they can be. Uh, and he's recently moved into the ranks of assistant management. So he's now part of Mark's uh, management team, working with Thomas and the other transportation managers uh, to deploy, deploy service and, and solve issues uh, as, as we uh, try to grow the system. So. We're so lucky to have him here. Uh, we're so grateful for the, for the great uh, influence you've had on your peers, your colleagues, and the people who work for you. Uh, a few fun facts. Uh, he, he's a big Husky fan. Uh, I learned that as well uh, early in our tenure, and we've agreed to disagree on that. Um, and that's part of a good relationship, right? We work together and still disagree on certain things. Um, he's a, a family man. He's got three kids, uh, a grandkid, and one on the way, I understand. Uh, July 4th, number two. Yeah. Nice. Oh, so you have two now. Yep. Yeah. Well, congratulations. So he loves to spend time with his family uh, out at the lake house. Um, he's had a number of uh, uh, observations made about him by some of his peers, uh, one of whom is over there, Thomas Gilbert, manager of transportation op uh, operations. So the first bit of advice he got from Thomas. Uh, from uh, Thomas, from uh, Trent. Thomas is in here. Thomas. <laughs> I know how to read. Uh, it's quote, life is a marathon, not a sprint. And in the end, the race is only against yourself, close quote, which is great advice for an aspiring leader. Uh, James Wagster, who I think is probably watching remote now, is in here in the room. Trent can bring levity to a stressful situation and is always encouraging people to step up to leadership roles. No matter when you run into him, he always has an encouraging word of advice or a joke to help get you through the day. I've enjoyed all my time working with him and for him. Uh, so that just gives you a sense of uh, how he's viewed by his colleagues. His nickname is T-Bone. So <laughs> I wish I'd known him in his playing days. That might have been something to see. Uh, he enterprised uh, some service innovation uh, in the 90s, the CTCBS service at the time, community-based service in and around Darrington and Smoky Point. Uh, and he's been active in the union as a, as a member of the IAM supervisor unit. He helped negotiate multiple contracts uh, before he moved into management. So we're glad to have you on the team. Thanks again. Congratulations. Well done. Well, stand right here. All right. We'll get that background. So we have the swag. That the paparazzi can oh. over. <laughs> Here you go. By the way, Trent is also the coach of the community and softball team. That's right. And he's on calling coach. We have a, a certificate of recognition, 30 years, congratulations, and a 30 year service pen. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
uh, and the mic is yours if you have anything to say in your own defense. <laughs> well, I see many of you do this many times, so I want to first lower it down here. That seems to be the, the only one thing. No, I'd just like to thank the board, uh, current leadership, Rick, past leadership, uh, the transportation crew, Jim Thomas, uh, for bringing me down the hall now with them. And just a great organization. Uh, I tell everyone that all the time. I've enjoyed my time here, and uh, that's about all I have to say, I guess. So thank you. Thank you for the 30 years. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, let's do many of those, uh, yeah. more of those 30 years. That'd be great. All right. Our next presentation is Youth Fair Free Youth Transit with Chris Simmons. Let's present that to us. All right. And I'll let Rachel bring up the presentation. There we go. I hope I'm doing this right. Uh, I guess we go from Sorry, Trent, the old guy in the room to the youth fairs. <laughs> um, this is just a brief policy update on where we stand with this process and kind of what is upcoming um, and hopefully where some of those issues align with your, your future work. So briefly, we're going to go through exactly what the law says as it's relevant to this free youth policy, uh, the potential revenue impacts, um, what we are considering outside of this policy for the impacts of it and uh, the schedule that we are currently on for uh, approval and subsequent implementation of a policy. Uh, the legislative language, uh, hopefully the slide is legible, but there is way too much type up there. So let me just kind of summarize this for you. Um, basically, if there is not a policy in place by uh, October 1st of 2022, then we are not eligible as an agency to be included in the transit support grant program. Now that's their official name for it. Basically it's a formula funding exercise whereby having this policy in place allows us to receive a formula amount of funding from the state out of the move ahead Washington package. Um, if the policy is not passed by that date, not only is the agency excluded from that formula for the remainder of the current biennium, it is also excluded for the next biennium, so the 23 to 25 timeframe. So a policy passed after October 1st would then not have the agency eligible under this formula funding program until July 1st, 2025. And my other point with this is it's not uh, by fuel type, it's not by any other criteria other than the passage of a, a free youth fair policy. Obviously, the revenue impacts were the first thing we took a look at in seeing this opportunity put in front of us. Um, these are estimates based on current ridership. You can come up with different estimates based on pre-pandemic ridership. I didn't think that that was necessarily the best way to be looking at this. So we've done an estimate uh, for the fourth quarter of this year, which would say it would be potentially a loss of 122,000 in revenue, or let's call it roughly $500,000 a year. Uh, we have received grant estimates out of the package from uh, the Washington State Transit Association as I don't wanna say verified, but let's say not disagreed with by WashDOT. Um, they have current funding in this biennium, that would be $4.3 million with the passage of, of such a policy and 12.2 million annually in the next biennium. So essentially this would turn into a loss of what we think would be about $500,000 worth of fair revenue in return for 2.2 million or $12.2 million of state funding. We did something. <laughs> My fault, Rachel. Oh, no. Let's try the next. Yes. Okay, good to go. 
So with that, the policy proposal is very simple. It strictly says that we would maintain a youth fair category, but that the price under that category across all services would be reduced to zero dollars and zero cents. There's some reasons for that on the back end with the data that I don't want to get into in terms of why we cannot just eliminate a youth fair category. This was, we felt, the simplest way to express the policy in a way that both satisfied the, the needs of the law, what WashDOT is going to come and look for for verification, and then for our own data reporting purposes moving forward. There are obviously spillover effects with that policy. They are not contained here. And they're not contained here because it's not directly relevant to the price or the law. It's spillover effects that affect our rules of conduct or our training opportunities or protocols and those pieces moving forward. We're dealing with those spillover effects in a separate process under a proposed rules of conduct adjustment. That process will be coming forward through the board, uh, starting with committees later this month and moving it forward, forward in front of the board for a first briefing next month. So as I move forward here, just note that many of those issues that we're looking to resolve as downstream effects of this policy, we're acknowledging, but we may not have full answers yet because that answer is still coming in a, a different policy mechanism. But what I do want to point out here, because it's directly related to the price, is that after our conversations with WashDOT around implementation of this policy and looking at our, our fair equity uh, policies internally, we don't feel we can require the use of an ORCA card by youth in order to have them access this free fare. It needs to be across all of our different methods of payment. That's not to say we are not going to be using the language of strongly encouraging youth to receive an ORCA card, especially those 13 and over, and get them used to the process of making a payment with a card, having the account on file so that when they reach 19 years old and over, their account can transition into that adult account and they, they are used to that process of, of onboard payment. However, we don't feel we can require it as a part of the process. So let me just briefly walk through some of the considerations that we've been examining as the downstream effects of this policy. Um, let me first talk about the age verification and fair evasion issues. Uh, a lot of that is a training issue. How, does our, how do our coach operators uh, approach that issue currently? How does our fair enforcement process currently work in order to verify that that payment has been made on board? We're looking to adjust that through that rules of conduct process, but the baseline idea is that shouldn't operate very differently than it does today. What we need to do is have youth used to using their ORCA cards and being able to verify that they've paid, even if it's zero dollars and zero cents, as they're boarding the bus or using our offboard payment systems. Some tweaks we still got to work through in the back end with our regional partners. There are some some regional considerations to that, but we're still working through that process. Um, Card requirement, um, the, the regional language that all of the ORCA card agencies have kind of settled on is the strongly encouraging language for those 13 or over to have an ORCA card. Uh, we're working on a process of distribution. Uh, we have roughly 30,000 ORCA cards that are legacy cards that we'll be, we will be receiving between now and the end of the year that we're hoping to have a process of distributing those through schools, likely starting with high schools closest to transit. Um, so not an even process, but we do think we have a way to have those cards in the hands of, of many of those youth before the end of the year. Uh, additionally, um, that offboard payment issue, how do they handle SWIFT? We're still working on those issues. We're hoping to have more of that as we come forward to the process next month. Um, additionally, we want to emphasize here that the legislation is not intended to replace yellow bus service. Um, that's specifically stated by the author of the legislation, that's specifically stated in the way that this uh, proposal is being put forward by WashDOT, and that's not our intent as an agency. It's, it's designed to be a supplement to the transportation that the schools are already providing, uh, especially for those students who would be looking to transfer to after-school jobs, after-school activities, um, maybe they have an after-school activity and they need to make, get home at a later date. So the idea is to offer that flexibility without replacing the service that the school districts are already offering. 
Uh, that said, we were also looking at the impacts on our passenger loads, what that might cause for those routes that are passing closest to those schools. We're looking at what adjustments we may need to anticipate ahead of time. Um, that process is actually wrapping up and, and we're looking to probably uh, make some fleet adjustments with routes around school bell times for the next service change so that uh, those routes that maybe would overfill a 40 foot bus are going to have a 60 foot bus uh, attached to it instead. Um, finally, a couple of the business issues that are, are being considered regionally. Um, if a youth buys a pass today, uh, there's going to be a value on that. How does that value get back to them? Um, does it go into an adult card for a relative or something along those lines? That's a regional question that's being put under discussion. And we are still waiting on WashDOT to give us their implementation instructions on how that reporting is going to work for their annual reporting process. They're also going to be requiring who is benefiting from this rule and how they are benefiting. We're waiting for instructions on how that data process is going to uh, be rolled out, hopefully. Um, they will have more information at the end of August at the state transit conference, but that's not been confirmed to us yet. So we're hoping we have that information soon. Uh, the timing considerations. Uh, because this is a fast track in order to stay on a schedule that would have us aligning with the regional partners on an implementation of a fair policy so that it could be live on September 1st. That's the, that Pierce Transit and King County Metro have identified as going live with this policy being in place for their agencies. We started a comment period on July 1st. That 30 day comment period would end on August 1st, um, just to get a sense of where the calendar is. So, obviously, this is an exceptionally accelerated process. Uh, briefing is today. Uh, the board hearing would take place on July 21st at 3 p.m. That's a formal hearing in the middle of the process. We would then go back to uh, the strategic, strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee, uh, SACDC in my parlance, uh, for the moved meeting of July 27th, for that committee to make a recommendation to the board by August 4th. Between that committee meeting and that August 4th board meeting, we'd have all of the, the comments wrapped up for you so that they'd be available for consideration at that board meeting as well as uh, a full Title VI analysis contained within that program. We're hoping to have that Title VI analysis ready for the committee hearing. So that gives you a sense of the accelerated timeline that we're on and uh, our intent to hopefully align with the rest of the region with as much of this policy as we possibly can. And with that, I am available for questions. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, good job. Any questions? I have one. Uh, no, yeah, I'm just trying to read. Uh, uh, on the rules of conduct, um, is it possible because there will be kids, and I'm going to say kids, riding buses that have never ridden before, and is it possible without rising their fear level to include some things like if you feel uncomfortable about somebody, you know, move up to where the coach operator is, if someone is, you know, smoking fentanyl or whatever, I don't even know if you smoke it, sorry about that. Uh, but is it possible to do some of that? And then I was also thinking that if we put together rules of conduct, is that something that we're going to include when they get their corporate card? Instead of like thinking they're going to get it when they get on the bus, but if the schools are handing them out, that is one of the things that would be with it. So let me just say that we are still working out all of the details on training and marketing. Um, there is a, we have confirmation that we have received a regional marketing grant. Um, I believe it's a $500,000 grant for all of the regional agencies to help launch with the marketing of the, the free youth project. Um, the details of that, we know we have the money. Now everyone's got to negotiate on, on what we're going to do with it. And uh, King County Metro has taken that lead. So there will be an awareness campaign uh, around the program. And we anticipate some of that also being some training exercises along with it. I don't know that we have full answers to that, but those are certainly concerns that we have both in our training process as well as in our, our rules of conduct and our communications processes. So. Uh, the last thing we want to see, obviously, is an unaccompanied youth 
uh, finding themselves in a difficult situation and not knowing what to do to be able to ask for help. Uh, that's actually been a lot on our minds as we've gone through this process. So I don't know we have the full answers yet, but we're hoping to very soon. Very shortly. Thank you. All right. To answer your question, no, I don't smoke it. <laughs> I'm not sure how she got two microphones either. Um, okay. Mayor Roberts. Uh, Chris, I was just wanting to make sure I maybe wasn't listening uh, uh, totally. Uh, uh, a youth would have to have an orchid card to get on the bus, right? They would not. They would not have to. What about, um, it seems to me that uh, the one thing that all youth do have is a smartphone. Is there any way to, because it would be really nice to be able to know uh, count wise and, and all that who's on the bus and, and that. So let me start with, we're gonna to have to report our youth ridership numbers to wash that as a component of this process. So data collection is another one of those. How do we make sure we get all of these pieces together in order to do the appropriate reporting has been, I don't wanna say first and foremost, because I think we started in safety and I think data reporting came in a, a very close second behind that. There is the opportunity now that we have upgraded the ORCA system that those phone apps are under development. I don't have a release timeline at this point. Uh, I can say that um, one platform would likely launch before another. Our intent would be to strongly encourage not just either having the ORCA card, but having the ORCA app uh, eventually for those youth. I don't think I can say that with any confidence that we will be, let's say, app-based or app-forward in the next 12 months. But the idea is definitely that we want to be leading with that app as it becomes available for that onboard payment. Yeah, because I could see um, a youth losing their ORCA card about like three times a week. <laughs> as the parent of a 14 year old yeah, yeah, who yeah. is occasionally clueless, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. I but told her smartphone. They're going to know where that's at. So exactly. Yes. <laughs> All right. Anybody else have any other questions? All right. Uh, Chris, thank you very much, and uh, did a great job representing Community Transit at the SCIP uh, Zoom meeting, so uh, it's good to see you out there. Thank you. All right, we have our next, uh, is finance for uh, the whole draft 2022 to 2027 Transit Development Plan. Thomas Tamala. Tamala? Tamala. Tamala. First time flying here, so bear with me. Um, so in, in front of you today is our draft transit development plan for 2022 and through 2027. And this is something we do every year. It's required by Washington State Department of uh, Transportation. Thank you. Um, so what is the TDP outside of that? It provides an agency an overview and accomplishments of uh, future plans. It's kind of essentially our short range transit plan or business plan, as they call it in some other states and jurisdictions. It looks at kind of the past year, but does a projection of the next, next five years, make sure sources and uses are balanced and implements um, long range planning efforts that are, are coming out of planning affect very large capital projects, the very small capital projects, and directly informs the, the budget process, which starts kind of in tandem and culminates in the, in the fall. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a uh, very public uh, facing process. Uh, um, it kind of started at committee a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is the first real bite into Apple where we actually have a complete package with the um, actual draft document with appendices also included that is a environmental uh, action for uh, state environmental policy act we have a, a public hearing at the top of the board meeting in, in, in august and it comes back to committee for targeted adoption on thursday september 1st uh, next slide please uh, So priorities, some of these are, are kind of shifting around from the, the last cycle and some of them are new. I kind of want to start with, there's an overall theme of focus on uh, service excellence coupled with addressing safety and security more broadly. Over the last two years, COVID um, safety and bringing back customers and kind of responding to the, the pandemic has been in the forefront that's still 
one of our top priorities, but we're kind of shifting gears now, especially as we um, really work towards redesigning our whole network. Uh, we have ongoing um, BRT expansion throughout the county and equitable service and accountability. We're strengthening local connections and reinvesting that service around the launch of Linwood Link Rail. We're also introducing service innovation, that's services that complement existing bus service and increase ridership and provide convenient equitable coverage, uh, connecting more communities with regional service. Our first pilot program will be launching in Linwood later this year. Uh, next slide. So the largest um, component probably of this um, effort outside of service planning is basically financial planning, kind of uh, looking at all of our revenue and, and, and costs and kind of running them through a formal um, financial model. A big component of that is the revenue picture and sales taxes. They have increased uh, up about 19% uh, in 2021 over 2020, far exceeding projections. And that continues, you continue to see that trend through the 2022 budget. Fair revenues continue to be lower than forecast and will definitely be impacted slightly by the um, free youth transit pass policy as those discount passes is, are basically set to, to zero. Uh, we've received a lot of federal stimulus funds over the last couple of years, but those are winding down. The agency has been benefiting from them by um, uh, strategically uh, moving them into uh, strategic uh, capital projects. And in alignment with um, past standard practice, uh, competitive grant funding for zero emission bus, which is um, likely to be very significant, is not assumed, but there are gonna be many new state and federal sources. So that will come into the light in, in the future um, budget and also uh, updates to the transit development plan. Um, and Chris kind of outlined his presentation on um, pre youth fares. We have the move ahead Washington funding that's contingent on adopting that policy that's been um, assumed in our financial analysis starting in uh, 2023 and then sunsetting after 16 years. Next slide. So I think uh, what's changed since last year, probably the most, well, the, the, the economy or the economic picture has really shifted and the economy is experiencing high inflation with projections of a near term recession. Um, we've done a lot of financial modeling around this. This is very unusual market conditions, things that we haven't really seen probably in 40 plus years. It's in front page news. Um, as part of this, when we, when we started this update and kind of into the spring, we did basically stress test financial modeling where we looked at uh, high inflation coupled with declining revenue service, uh, revenue uh, sources, uh, notably sales tax, we kind of emulated what we actually experienced during the Great Recession around 2009, 2010, and kind of layered them together to kind of see how that um, resulted in a, a new bottom line. And it passed a, a stress test. What's presented in front of you today is kind of a different combination of you know high to medium revenues, but also very high in inflation, especially in the, in the next, over the next two years. Um, the, this is probably current uh, market conditions, but again, we're, we're seeing these kind of increasing trends, at least for the next year or two. Uh, next slide, please. So for, for priorities here, um, number one, um, kind of think of this as like a four-legged stool is excellent service, uh, strong operating reserves. So we're kind of project, protected against some of the kind of unknowns I was just speaking about, but also kind of setting aside money for capital renewal and other needs in the, in the coming years, uh, service innovation and that, that very robust capital program, building out SWIFT extensions and out zero emission bus, probably two of the biggest uses going forward. Uh, next slide, please. Robust capital program. So kind of right now, and you're kind of standing on it, as, as they say, um, this is the facilities master plan. The Cascade building just opened this spring. The existing Merrill Creek admin building will be converted into transportation operations building, future projects to renovate the ride store and also a storage and training facility, which you'll hear about later in the board meeting today. Uh, zero emission infrastructure, that's both vehicles and sort of uh, base facilities, training a, a very large, impactful capital investment. There's a zero emission bus study that's ongoing that will inform that eventual strategy. 
a bus stop program that's a capital program for bus stop improvements. The early work is underway to assess needs and prioritize investments, especially through the lens of a lot of the um, network restructure planning that we're doing. And Swift Network Orange Line uh, construction, of course, is underway, and Gold Line uh, scoping is also underway this uh, spring. Um, the Green Line extension, that's the extension from Bothell Canyon Park to Eda Bothell and downtown Bothell, touches the TDP rising year 2027, and will bring the Green Line actually uh, into Bothell, will interface with the Sound Transit Strike 2 and Strike 3 lines. Uh, fleet replacements right size to 2024 network plan, but the fleet will continuously expand to meet that 2027 service hours forecast, which includes the uh, year one operations of the Swift Gold Line. Next slide. Strong reserves. Uh, we've increased the fuel reserve for this budget uh, cycle and in, in all of our modeling from 5 million to 5 and a half billion. That's kind of self-evident with the you know huge uptick in diesel prices. Um, there's been a facility and infrastructure preservation reserve to address infrastructure replacement and requirements. There's a technology replacement reserve that's been added to reflect the increasing value and utilization of technology and systems at uh, community transit and um, a, a large um, set aside for uh, zero emission again to cover um, some of the, the premium costs of the vehicles that are acquired, but especially the infrastructure and other ancillary investments being associated with that. Uh, next slide, please. Excellent reliable service. And um, the 2024 network plan is, is pretty much the, the keystone of this. And um, that's been out in public outreach this um, spring and we'll be back with the final plan in front of this body in late 2022. Um, Swift network expansions underway on multiple fronts with the orange line, blue line extension, and gold line. Uh, coach operator hiring, which is underpinning this push. Um, if we've increased the class sizes to 12 and are offering a $5,000 hiring bonus this spring with larger graduations um, beginning this summer. Uh, the van pool fleet, um, which, which is um, been kind of right sizing over the last two years during the start of the pandemic has shrunk based on decreased demand and is now kind of leveling off at a steady state um, responsive to that new level of demand. Uh, next slide. So looking at our, our biggest portfolio of service, our fixed route service that includes, you know, feeder, local feeder, rural service, kind of um, starting, kind of getting back into um, you know, restoration and then some expansion up into the launch of our 2024 network, which is um, in development. And then you see little kind of pulses there, kind of building out that network vision, um, especially along the lines of higher frequency service on, on, on weekdays and, and some on weekends. And then with that swift gold line in 2027 at the tail end of the plan. And I would also have a kind of a smaller version of what we're doing in 2024, kind of a mini service restructure in North County associated with it. Um, next slide. Service innovation. Uh, the Linwood pilot, um, which is a 12 month pilot, will, will follow a micro transit service model. I know we want to be kind of open minded about that, that this is probably, probably a multitude of um, different solutions from you know, community vans to the very familiar micro um, transit um, that. That is a kind of our first foray into this, and we'll be uh, launching at the end of this year. Uh, looking, looking, kind of later in the year as well uh, as part of our digital strategy, kind of the front door on the internet to the agency. The, the website will be updated and included that as an open trip planner, which is a um, big upgrade for customer service and, and um, the writing public, and continuous emphasis on research, pulse surveys, customer surveys. And um, some new emphasis, of course, on youth riders and kind of surveying them, collecting data due to the new uh, state legislation. So next and last slide here is, um, once again, a recap of the process. We're here uh, in early July. Public comment begins today. Public comment ends in early August. And kind of in advance of that date is, is the public 
hearing and um, kind of in between there is also sort of this um, determination of um, non-significance in the SEPA environmental process that runs about two weeks for the comment period here in July. Um, this all gets brought back to this body kind of at the end of the summer a committee in um, August and at the board on September 1st. That's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? We're seeing nothing. Mm -hmm. Seven, did an excellent job. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. All right, to bring us a CEO report. Uh, we'll remember the three minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we have uh, moved to the uh, written uh, CEO report, which you have in your packet. Rachel sent that around earlier today. So we'll just touch on a few items briefly. Um, you've heard several references today to our zero emission study. We're in full swing on that and uh, making a number of field visits to our peer agencies to learn from those who have uh, preceded us into this space. Uh, we sent a group down to Sunline Transit in Palm Springs a couple weeks back. That's an agency that is using hydrogen. Uh, we have toured Everett Transit's uh, facilities. Last week we went to King County Metro and looked at their uh, charging test station uh, at their south base. And on Monday, we'll be uh, going over to Wenatchee uh, to take a look at Link Transit. That's the agency in the state that's probably got the most experience with zero emission buses, uh, given their proximity to the Chelan County PED. So uh, in addition, I think Tuesday of next week, we'll be hosting a group from the Snohomish PUD. Uh, they're coming over to take a tour of, of our facilities and, and see what our physical plant looks like and to begin laying groundwork for, for future partnering with, with them. Uh, so very exciting. Uh, we'll probably be back uh, with the board uh, in some kind of workshop or briefing uh, later in the fall uh, to report more fully on what we're learning. Um, shifting gears quickly to safety and security issues, I wanted to let the board know that we're moving ahead with a pilot project to test uh, coach operator uh, safety doors on board our vehicles. Uh, this is something that's been a, a, a pretty consistent area that we've heard feedback from uh, coach operators on. Uh, so we've done a request for information to the industry to evaluate a number of different safety door types. And um, we've identified a product that we're going to take into test mode and, and uh, are, are doing that work here over the next couple of months. Um, this is something that our labor partners have been very interested in. Um, ATU members are participating uh, in the evaluation uh, of these doors. And uh, so we will report back to you as well on what we're learning there. This is something, again, that's uh, the purpose of this is to enhance the sense of safety on board the vehicles for the coach operators and address some of the concerns you've been hearing about over the past several months. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are participating in a study uh, being done by the University of Washington. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, focus and speculation and reporting on uh, onboard air quality and uh, issues around that and exposure uh, to potentially harmful substances. So we were approached and agreed to participate uh, in, in an evaluation. And we've had teams of researchers from UW out uh, on SWIFT a couple of times to gather data and take samples. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing if there's something that comes out of that that we can learn uh, about the effectiveness of our <laughs> equipment that we've invested in and, and, and what the situation is on board the, the buses from the standpoint of employee exposure. Uh, we're continuing with our security emphasis uh, on the SWIFT Blue Line, um, and we've seen some success. We've reported at the committee level and elsewhere about how that's been going uh, one week a month. Uh, our, our goal there is to ultimately be able to maintain a security presence in the field throughout the service day, uh, all the way to midnight. Uh, so we're learning some things, and we're going to take those learnings into the proposed 2023 budget uh, and so you'll see some ideas and some proposals uh, to continue this effort on a permanent basis when we submit the budget later this year. Uh, we're also working uh, with the transit police and the sheriff's office to, to make sure we're leveraging as much as we can uh, out, of the, out of the contract with the sheriff. Uh, that's obviously been an area where they've experienced some staffing challenges as well. Uh, so we're in a continuous engagement uh, with, with the sheriff about making sure we're maintaining as much of a presence out there as we can. Uh, but we're gonna have to supplement that uh, 
I'm, I'm pretty convinced of that at this point, based on how things have been going the last couple of months with our experimental interventions. Um, speaking of staffing and recruitment, uh, since January, we've hired 63 uh, new employees at Community Transit and promoted another 35. Uh, we're fully staffed now in transportation management, uh, supervisor ranks and dispatch. Uh, so we feel pretty good about where we are there. Um, we're recruiting aggressively coach operators and mechanics. Uh, we had three new coach operators graduate last week. We've got a class of six in July and are targeting a class of 12 in August. Uh, and we feel pretty good about being able to meet our service commitments based on how recruiting is going so far. The financial incentive has shown a response. We've probably received around 200 applications over the past month in response to that. So, so that's good news. We've made a splash in the market. Uh, now we've got to weed through that and make sure we've got um, candidates uh, who are a good fit for the job. Executive recruitment is underway for a new chief financial officer. Uh, that recruitment went live last week. And our recruiter is out now actively uh, recruiting uh, individuals. We've seen some good interest so far in that position. Uh, on the COVID front, um, we experienced a total of 51 cases in June. So that's the second highest month since the pandemic started. Our previous high was 69 cases in January. Uh, these numbers mirror largely what's going on in Snohomish County as a whole. Um, my report says we've experienced seven cases in July, but between the time this was printed and the time I came down here, we had an eighth. So you can see that the, the new variants uh, are, are out there and they are active. Uh, Snohomish County Health District has reported that we're now moving into the high risk zone. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control will publish new county level data next Monday. So we're watching this situation very closely to see if there's any implications about uh, additional safety measures we may need to take around masking and gatherings and whatnot. So we're not done. We may be done with the virus, but the virus is definitely not done with us. Uh, service and ridership updates. So ridership continues to increase incrementally. Uh, we're averaging now pretty well over 18,000 riders per day. Uh, that's about 58% of our pre-pandemic daily ridership and about 34% higher than this time in 2020, uh, which is terrific. So we continue to operate service at about 83% of pre-pandemic levels. And we're consistently delivering about 98 to 100% of our scheduled trips on weekdays, uh, less on weekends, uh, because we're having staffing challenges on weekends. Our contracted services, um, are uh, struggling as well, uh, and the frequencies there, or excuse me, the efficiencies there are, are in the mid 90s. Uh, so we're working with our contractor first transit to see what we can do to shore those, those up. Um, on the financial side, uh, more good news. Uh, we received once again, uh, the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award from the GFOA for the 2022 adopted budget. So kudos again. Uh, to Lori, to Mary, and, and all of the budget team that worked so hard to make sure we've got a, a clear and transparent and accountable budget. Uh, it's the highest form of recogni recognition in governmental budgeting, so it's a source of pride for all of us here at CT. And it's the fourth consecutive year uh, we've received that particular award. We're well into 2023 budget preparation, as I indicated, uh, so we will uh, once we get through the transit development plan update, uh, we will start uh, to engage with you at the committee level on the proposed budget. Uh, so we've got a, a kickoff uh, at the October board meeting, um, and we'll use the board meetings in October, uh, November, and December to review and, and get the budget updated. And Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. I don't know if any, uh, me and the board have any questions. Or uh, okay. Uh, we're going to move to our committee reports. The executive committee met on Thursday, June the 16th. Uh, Council Member Schwede, Council Member Merrill, Council Member Daughtry, and I attended. The committee reviewed resolution number 1222, the emergency authorization, and recommended it to be placed as an action item on today's meeting agenda. The CEO provided his report, which sounded 
similarly to the one you gave today. Uh, the next executive committee is scheduled for July 21st at 1130 a.m. And uh, it will also be continue to be on uh, online on Zoom. All right, our next is Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee, Council Member Merrill. Yes, the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development yeah. Committee meeting was held remotely over Zoom on Wednesday, June 15th, 2022 at 2 p.m. The meeting was attended by Mayor Marine, Council Member Merrill, and Labor Representative Lance Norton. <coughs> Absent were Council Member Jared Mead and Council Member Stephanie Wright. The committee reviewed and forwarded two action items appearing on today's agenda. We'll hear from this later. Award of IPB number 2022-055, Vehicle Storage and Training Facility, and award of RFQ number 2017-79, Task Order for Merrill Creek Maintenance Building Improvements Facilities Master Plan Phase 3B Design. Uh, Greg Stamatow will Amatia will present both action items. Uh, the committee reviewed and forwarded two informational items presented earlier in today's meeting. Uh, the Youth Fair, uh, the Youth Fair Free Youth Transit Pass by uh, Mr. Simmons and the Draft 2022-2027 Transit Development Plan by Mr. Kamala. The committee heard a brief update from D. Tapia, EPO and Transit Technology Manager on the agency's zero emission technology project. The next meeting of the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee is Wednesday, July 27th. Make a note, that's move at 2 p.m. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councilman Romero. Councilman Schwede has our Finance Performance and Oversight Committee report. Okay, the Finance Performance and Oversight Committee met on Thursday, June 16, 2022 via Zoom. Board members, Christine Fetzel, John Nearing, Sid Roberts, and I attended. Uh, consent items, uh, approval of May 2022 monthly expenditures and payroll, which are items 7B through 7F on the agenda. Action items, consideration of resolution number 14-22 regarding tuition reimbursement, which is item 8A on the agenda. Treva Kowalski, Manager of Training and Staff Development will provide a presentation on the tuition reimbursement program and the proposed changes during this meeting. Uh, report safety and security update. Uh, the committee received a briefing on the ongoing steps the agency has taken to improve safety on certain parts of the transit corridors. Uh, the May 2022 sales tax report. Uh, in May 2022, Community Transit collected approximately $17.2 million in sales tax revenue. This was approximately $2.3 million more than budgeted. May sales tax collections reflected purchases made in March 2022. A copy of this report is included in your packet. Uh, the May 2022 diesel fuel update and report the budget team continues to closely monitor fuel costs as fuel prices have continued to increase. Year to date through May 2022, Community Transit paid an average of $3.67 per gallon for diesel fuel compared to the 2022 amended budget amount of $3.33 per gallon. This was a negative variance of 34 cents per gallon. Uh, the next meeting of the Finance and Performance Oversight Committee is scheduled for 2 p.m. Thursday, July 21st via Zoom. Uh, thank you, Council Archway. All right, we have six items on consent. Uh, if anybody has any, they need to pull and have any questions on the consent. All right, I will accept a motion to approve the consent. Move to approve consent agenda. All right, we got a motion. How about a second? Second. All right, we move and second to any discussion on. The motion to accept the consent. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that will pass unanimously, which takes us to our first action item um, resolution number 1422, the tuition reimbursement program. Trevor, how's Lasky? That's a mouthful, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did I do okay? You did okay. Right. It's Trevor or Treva, but it's actually Treva. Okay, and it's Kozlowski. 
because it was anglicized and the W was dropped. So there you go. <laughs> so you can't, you know, you're fine. Anyway, you go, you're good. So tuition reimbursement. Um, we at Community Transit have had a tuition reimbursement program for many, many years. And we've had any number of participants in that program. And we've been back to the board a, a couple of times for updates. This one is a little bit broader in update than we have had in the past. Um, so as you see, we've had it since 1998. Uh, I actually was a recipient of tuition reimbursement at the agency, moved up from um, being a coach operator and thankfully had a degree that helped me jump make that leap. And that is oftentimes um, how the program is used. It is used by current employees who are looking either for uh, lateral opportunities or promotional opportunities where a degree or a certificate really helps in that push. And in that regard, it is really a useful tool in attracting new talent to the organization as well. And as we've heard through many presentations today, uh, hiring and attracting new talent is a very important goal of the agency moving forward. So this really is an opportunity to update that program and make it very attractive to potential new hires. Um, and it also helps us retain talent. There is benefit in what you learn of being an employee and moving either laterally or promotionally. So we want to take advantage of that and keep employees here and take advantage of what they have learned over time. So we're really looking at a couple of opportunities to change. Currently, the program is a flat rate. You get $3,000 a year, and it covers only tuition. No books, no fees. Well, the world has changed. Um, $3,000, if you're going for a master's degree, is nearly nothing. And on the other hand, fees are very, very common. As we've moved away from a traditional classroom, colleges look to have fees, for example, in order to still pay for their buildings because they still need facilities, even though they may not have as many attendees. So we're really looking to change the program and look at it as in three tiers. The first tier is really people who are what we call that first level dabbler. So they're, they're going to community colleges, maybe they're getting a certificate, maybe they haven't decided exactly where they're headed with their careers, but they're just beginning to dabble. And those programs are generally far less expensive. So what we're looking to ask you to provide um, approval for is that those programs, if we target a 50% reimbursement rate, would be a $2,000 reimbursement. That does nothing negative to those who are currently in participation. So it still gives them, they don't generally go full time. They don't generally take advantage of those more expensive programs. Uh, the other group, the second tier, are those who are seeking a bachelor's degree. Those again, that's a more expensive program. We would look to reimburse a target of 50% of their costs of tuition, and we would also include fees for all of these groups, so we're covering those fees. That group then for a 50% target would be up to $6,500. And then we occasionally get uh, those who are seeking a master's degree. A lot of those are executive master's degree programs, such as the MBA or an MPA at the University of Washington. So those are very costly programs. And so a 50% target for that would be 50% reimbursement up to $14,500. That really does bring us into more into alignment with what experiences for employees if we want to meet them halfway in their growth, in their personal growth in the agency. A uh, couple of quick things then about this three-tier program is we're asking you to approve that. That's a change from the $3,000. We also currently do not allow participation by employees who are in their probationary period. But as I said, as a recruitment tool, we are asking you to give authority for the CEO to waive that in hard to hire positions. So currently, for example, we could recruit at the local technical college for mechanics while they are still in school. And, and they may want to come to work for us, for example, drive or uh, uh, fueling the buses at night. And so Rick could say, yes, that's a very hard position to fill and we would like to include them immediately when they start. So we're asking for permission for that. 
And the current policy include or excludes, specifically excludes part-time employees. We really only have part-time coach operators, but it didn't seem quite fair to be coming to ask for an update to the policy and still exclude our part-time employees because they, they are a valuable part of the organization and should get to participate fully. That's it. So the recommendation then is that the board of directors approve this resolution 1422 adopting the revisions to the tuition reimbursement policy as part of section 6.5 of the personnel policy manual. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes, I do have a question. Yes, Councilmember Dockery. So do we have any data that would depict how much of those who have taken advantage of the program and then left the agency? It does happen. Um, it only happens if I had, to, I don't have any specific data other than I've been supervising the program, administering the program for many, many years. It does happen. I would say maybe 5% of the time. It's fairly rare. They usually stay. Um, employees usually say we actually looked at that we did we did um i'll say struggle with that fact um and thought about trying to uh, get the money back that's really what the question always is it's 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 nearly impossible it's nearly impossible from a financial standpoint Lori was like oh please don't do that to me. <laughs> um, it would be very difficult to enforce that kind of a policy. It does happen. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, a couple of things. Um, I strongly endorse the company helping uh, people with their degrees and their uh, certificate programs. So, yeah, I'm really behind this, um, having taken advantage of this one of my previous employers. Uh, do we have any sense of the number of employees that have taken advantage of the program? So, in the last Four years, we've had 19 individuals, um, distinct, unique, specific individuals participate. Uh, so as the programs go, whoops, they might participate over the course of several years. So uh, currently we have 12 actively involved in the program. And I have a follow-up question, if I may. Um, as I was reading through the packet on this, uh, we did, I did see in there where, um, we tried to target it around uh, either a the job you were doing or the job you may want. Right. Um, but do we have any limit on and that you had to go to an accredited schooling? But do we have any limit on what school they might pick? So uh, I want to just correct one okay. piece. We have separate funds if you are looking to improve your performance or gain new information, knowledge, and skills in your current role. This is specifically for employees who are looking for opportunities outside their current role. Um, we, do, we do not limit what college you can go to other than it must be an accredited program. So we, we don't wanna pay for you to go get a degree then. And we, you also must, the degree must be for a role that can, community transit could use that knowledge and skills. So while you might want to go be a nurse, I don't know if I want to do that good right now, but you might want to go be a nurse. We don't have a nurse. So we would not, we would not approve your participation in that program. Sam, mm -hmm. help me answer the question. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? All right, sure. And I think it makes perfect sense to it's amazing when you invest in your employees, right? Well, they're afraid, well, they're going to take that and leave. Well, they actually might say, this is a pretty good, good, pretty good place to work. I think I will stay. So there's always that. Yep. All right. Thank you very much. So no further questions. Is there a motion? We can always discuss. Oh, yeah. I'll make a motion. All right. Uh, that the right Board of Directors approve resolution number 14-22. Uh, adopting revisions to the tuition reimbursement policy as part of section 6.5 of the personnel policy manual. Second. All right. So moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All right. Seeing and hearing none, all in favor say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed? All right. That will pass unanimously. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, for that. All right, our next item is approved resolution number 1222, emergency management. 
John Hemsworth. A name I can pronounce. Unless I messed it up. No, you're you're good on that one. Thank you though. Well, I don't have any slides, so I can't mess up the technology. <laughs> That's the, the one positive. Um, so good afternoon. My name is John Holdsworth. I'm the uh, Assistant Manager of Emergency Management and Business Continuity. Um, so in 2019, uh, Community Transit hired an emergency management consultant. Uh, that consultant conducted a gap analysis and developed some recommendations um, and drafted an emergency operations plan. Emergency operations plan uh, is used for emergencies and disasters or incidents uh, that exceeds normal capabilities. It includes the uh, conditions and actions necessary for declaring a state of emergency, uh, provides a foundation for responding to an emergency, uh, and provides uh, regular communication to, a, to the board during, uh, during those emergencies. The consultant uh, identified that an emergency resolution process uh, was needed for um, and proposed as part of uh, that emergency operations plan adoption. The EOP was not finalized um, at the start of COVID, so the start of 2019. Uh, it was adopted in, in mid-2020. I'm sorry, COVID in, in uh, 2020 was, it was adopted in mid-2020. Um, obviously, the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, expedited the timeline and the, the actions needed um, for an emergency resolution. Um, so uh, authorizing the CEO to, to take actions to respond to, to COVID. Um, so resolution 01-20 was, uh, was proposed and adopted. I believe that was uh, included in your packet. Uh, resolution 01-20 well, was meant to provide the CEO with enough authority um, to respond to COVID until the EOP was adopted um, and a new resolution process could be, could be drafted and approved. Um, you know, obviously at that time, no one could have predicted that uh, that COVID would last for, for now two and a half years. So um, we're back here to uh, to continue that process and, and revise and adopt a new resolution. Uh, resolution 01-20 did not declare an emergency um, and it did not identify um, COVID-19 as a hazard concern. However, the, the CEO used uh, the federal, state, and local proclamations as well as that resolution to respond to COVID. Some of the things that were, uh, were used under that emergency resolution, uh, the CEO used, uh, used it to procure COVID supplies, uh, make fair adjustments and service changes, um, and ensure employee safety and benefits. Uh, the CEO has not used that uh, emergency authorization and those, those authorities since late 2021. Uh, the version before you, um, 12-22 uh, improves upon 01-20 by incorporating lessons observed from COVID, uh, assessing best practices from our partner transit agencies and from local governments, um, and incorporates feedback from our partners. So what's the same? Still allows the CEO to manage emergencies and provides flexibility for smaller scale incidents um, through related resolutions, uh, such as emergency procurement, and it identifies uh, key areas where emergency actions or emergency authorization, authorization may be necessary. What's different? So it identifies the emergency operations plan uh, for the conditions and actions uh, that may necessitate emergency authorities. It provides a sustainable and balanced resolution that includes the ability for the CEO to immediately respond to those life safety issues um, and ensure continuity of operations and service. Um, during a prolonged incident. But it also provides the board of directors additional communication conduits and an opportunity for the board to scope and scale the emergency authorities if necessary as applicable to each emergency. It requires the CEO to provide a regular justification to remain under an emergency proclamation. Uh, in closing, the resolution provides a clear path forward for con the continued emergency management program within normal operations and identifies the steps and actions should an emergency or disaster impact community transit. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, John. I think we first have Mayor Nareth on online. Yes, Chair Marine, can you hear me okay? I apologize, I'm in my car now, but I'm not driving. Can you hear me all right, though? Yeah, we can hear you. 
Thank you. Yeah, I, well, first of all, I want to say I do appreciate the progress I think made with this policy. I, I think uh, it is it's a helpful um, move. I, I do have concerns about it, though. I think my concerns stem from, and this, again, uh, this has nothing to do with Rick. I think Rick uh, has uh, handled himself very astutely and has not overstepped, uh, you know, when given emergency powers. But it's our job as elected officials and, and policymakers of the agency, I think, to make sure we scour such policies to ensure that regardless of who's in that chair, we're protecting the taxpayers and, and everybody else that has a stake in this agency. Um, so my concern, I think, you know, when we prior to COVID, you know, two, three years ago, when we thought of emergency powers, we thought of them much differently, I think, at least I did as mayor. And, and so, you know, our city council could, could do, have similar questions to what I'm sharing here in that, there was usually a defined end to an emergency. It was rather short in duration. And so while we were granting um, significant powers to an executive, whether it be a, a mayor or a county executive, a governor, or a CEO of a public agency, whoever, we were granting them you know, pretty significant powers. It was for a short period of time with a pretty defined emergency and a pretty defined start and end date. COVID has kind of blown that up. Um, and so while I, I, again, want to stress that I think Rick has handled himself very well with the best of intentions, I haven't agreed with everything Rick's done, but that's not the point. Uh, it's not my, it's my job to set policy and then, and then Rick, Rick does what he feels uh, is best. And, um, and so, but I don't think that everybody in executive positions throughout COVID has used emergency powers in the proper way. I think uh, some have gone over that old axiom you know, never let a good crisis go to waste and implemented things that they've wanted to implement for a long time, but couldn't do under normal circumstances. And so I think it's time, it's high time, in my opinion, that legislative bodies rein these uh, emergency powers back in. And so, again, this is, this is more of a, I guess, a soapbox point of mine, but I do think there are a couple areas where I think we could even improve on this policy. And I think, again, I think John and Rick, everybody involved is uh, has the best of intentions in here. This is not a community transit uh, related issue that, that my concerns are from, but I'm on the board of community transit, so I feel the need to, to make sure this policy um, enacts some of these things. One I would say would be, I would feel much more comfortable. I know Rick has to check in with the board when he does things and check in every 90 days. And I've spoke with Rick about this this afternoon, and I think they may have worked on some things that we can discuss if we get a motion on the on the floor, but I would feel much better if the board had to reauthorize this every 90 days. It's one thing to check back in every 90 days. Very few board members would, I think, say, hey, hold on, I want to actually, you know, end these emergency powers. It's a lot easier for board members to really take a hard look at this when they know they have to vote on it every 90 days. Then you've got to really sit down and say, should we reauthorize this for another 90 days? As opposed to, oh, Rick's just given me a CEO report. Now I've got to really rock the boat if I want to cut these emergency powers back or something. So I would feel much better with a 90-day reauthorization. Every 90 days, this thing gets extended. The board has to approve of it. I don't think that's too much to ask. Um, secondly, I'm a little uncomfortable with the level of personnel policy uh, authority given to the CEO under these emergency uh, authorizations. I, I think in, for the most part, personnel um, policies should be a board decision. And I think we've seen some examples of that. Um, they may turn out to be exactly the same, but, but I think there's some policies that were enacted under an emergency ordinance, maybe in response to an emergency, but they weren't enacted in a in an emergency fashion. What I mean by that is usually when we say we need to grant these emergency authorizations because there's not time to gather the board, there's not time to do the legislative body, we need to get this done. That's not really the case with personnel policies in a lot of instances. So again, I think this is an area where I'm not really comfortable with personnel policies being part of this. If somebody can show me where personnel policies may fall into the traditional emergency powers, I may be uh, fine with that but I think they should come back at the next uh, regularly scheduled board meeting for ratification by the board. So those would be my two um, pieces of input. One, reauthorization every 90 days by the board, an actual vote, and two, either remove personnel policies from this, there's one section on it, or 
if we need to leave personnel policies in, um, have it come back for ratification to the board, whatever that change in personnel policies is at the very next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Neary. Uh, any other questions with regard to the emergency powers? Just, uh, uh, just a, a point uh, of uh, uh, Mayor, Mayor Roberts. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering with, it sounds like there's, there's a few things that have been discussed and uh, I take John's comment seriously. Uh, this doesn't seem like it's something that has to get past this meeting. I'm just wondering if we could, you know, work this over a little bit and bring it back for uh, a vote at the next meeting. That's just my thought. I just hate to, to legislate at the dais here and do a lot. You're of asking things. if it's an emergency. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're going to do. Emergency powers under emergency. That was that's what I was thinking. Uh, yeah, and that's obviously a good uh, point as well. I mean, if there's no urgency to it, uh, I think it would give time because obviously we it, it can pass as is. It can come to the floor with an amendment. The amendment can be voted on. Well, you guys know you're all in the same thing. Um, we can go through it and deal with that if you feel more comfortable with some of what John gave him a chance to put it down on paper as an amendment and bring it back. We can certainly do that. Um, well, this will give us a chance yeah. to slow think it a little bit and let staff interact with it and bring it back. That seems to me, if it was just one word or something, um, that was one thing. <clears throat> but it sounds like to me it's a few things and that need to be thought through on. That's just enough. Yeah. yeah. So I know the bricker John wants to address his um, the emergency side of it as well as you know the timing. Yeah. Well, I agree with uh, uh, Mayor Roberts. Uh, uh, Mayor Dutry. Or Council Member Dutry. And I well, I agree with Mayor Roberts and Mayor Neary uh, on both those points. I think he's right. Uh, I'd rather see that as a change in, in this particular policy. Um, and reading to it, I didn't find anything else that uh, came to the forefront of anything that would be a problem there. Uh, I, I tend to agree with Mayor Mearing on that, on his two points. I'd like to see some change to that. Uh, Rick? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank the board members for their interest uh, in these issues. Um, I uh, obviously brought this uh, action item forward because I think it's important for us to review and reflect on the experience we've had here over the past two years and update our practices to incorporate lessons learned. Um, so the item before you does that, as John laid out, it gets us aligned with our partner agencies in the transit industry. It gets us aligned with our partner agencies within Snohomish County uh, in local government. Uh, in terms of best practice, uh, Mayor Nearing and I had an opportunity to talk a couple of times today uh, after he reviewed the item, and uh, we, we did talk about it uh, with our safety team uh, this morning and again this afternoon and consulted with council, and we did develop some, some language that would build into this uh, uh, a board action. Um, so we, we can, we can uh, share that and consider that. Um, the personnel policy side of this, uh, I, I haven't thought through. I would offer by way of example, some of the things uh, we did during the pandemic uh, on that score. That, that is the authority that we, we used to provide premium pay uh, to, to drivers and mechanics, safety sensitive personnel. Uh, it's what we used to uh, require uh, face coverings and other safety protocols uh, within the service and within the facilities. Um, I, I haven't reflected at length, and so I speak with some hesitation, but those are operational considerations that I think are pretty important uh, for the executive to be able to retain in order to respond effectively uh, in, in a crisis. So, you know, I, I think that's something I would uh, take under consideration. I, I would urge you to consider very carefully any changes there. Um, but as far as the, uh, uh, you know, as an executive and as somebody who's vested with a lot of authority to respond to a difficult situation, I'm, I'm interested in having a lot of transparency in my discussion with policymakers uh, who are ultimately responsible to the public. So I think it's important to build in some sideboards to make sure we have that, that we have transparent uh, discourse uh, between us uh, and for the public and that we have an opportunity uh, to, uh, for the board to express itself uh, if things are prolonged. 
Um, the recommendation that we got from staff today in consulting on this was that we build into this uh, an amendment essentially that would establish a, a check back at 180 days. Um, that if I declared an emergency under this resolution, uh, I would have to report back monthly. Uh, I could extend it at 90 day intervals. After the first extension at 180 days, if I see a need for it to continue further, at that point, I'd have to get the board's concurrence. And then each 90 days again thereafter. The thinking on 180 days is that's six months. Uh, that's the interval between our service changes. Um, typically, the main thing we're doing in response to an emergency is changing service and how we deploy our service and how we deploy our vehicles and use our facilities. Uh, so, you know, that kind of check back, I think, would make sense to us. Um, I won't speak to the question uh, of action today versus action at the next meeting. Uh, I'm certainly uh, happy to support the board in its deliberation either way. Um, if you feel like you need more time to think about this, uh, I would just reiterate what I think John indicated earlier. There's no sense of urgency about moving this forward. Uh, we just wanted to make sure we were updating our our uh, practices and our policies based on uh, lessons learned. So, very good. Thank you for that. Yeah, I just, yeah Councilor Choi. Um, I just wanted on John's comment about uh, 90 days on the resolution item five. If you read that, that's what it says is that it comes back and can be terminated after uh, every three months, it comes back to the board. And can't be terminated. That's actually the final uh, word in thing that is under five in the resolution itself. That right above your name. <laughs> may I may I respond to that, Chair Marine? Uh, Mayor Mary. Yeah, I, I did read that, Jan, and I went over it with the chief executive. We don't. I don't believe the wording. And again, I'm in my car now. I apologize. I don't believe it. It requires the board to re-vote on it every 90 days, and that's what I was asking. And I think the CEO agreed with me that it wasn't real clear there. So I think there's just, for my, for my comfort level at least, I'm just one board member. There's not enough. Uh, it's not clear enough that the board has to vote on it every 90 days. If that was the intention, that's great. Let's let's word wordsmith it so it's really really clear. Again, this is my opinion that the board votes to reauthorize every 90 days. That, that was my only, um, my only concern with that. And I, and I, did, I do know what, what part of that you're talking about, board member Sweaty. All right, yeah, thank you for that, uh, that update. And, and I think in John uh, Marinari and I talked about it as well, and that was his, his thing is just, when you have to vote for something, you, you, you take it maybe a little bit more serious and oh, here, read this, you know, the updates. Um, and I've got to say, when when you when you get other executives, that's a nice thing having some mayors and some council members on the board. Is that uh, usually that's coming from a council member? I, don't, I want a little bit more authority. And the mayor is usually saying, "Well, wait a second. What, what are we, we're <laughs> we're giving you the information." So when it's coming from another executive, say, "Hey, we we just want to make sure um, I, I take it in good faith that yeah, they're they're not trying to take control or to." To step on any any toes there, they're just saying, ultimately we're we're going to be held accountable, and so, and quite frankly, then we take some of that heat. Right? Well, you guys voted for it, you, you continue to. So, um, I support the mayor and Aaron in this, um, but certainly, however, the board would like to do either take it up today, vote on it, make the changes, or have it come back to you, whatever you're comfortable with. That's my so, time. Mayor Aaron. Uh, you stated every 90 days what uh, CEO said was after eight, uh, 180, days, 180 days and then every 90 days. Does that meet your requirements for uh, for doing this or do we want to go every 90 days no matter what? Yeah, uh, yeah that's a good question. And I appreciate the CEO and his staff putting that together real quickly based on our conversation earlier today. I think it's a, a really good step and it just reinforces to me that Rick and the staff's heart is exactly in the right place here. They're not trying to do anything. Um, I would feel better at every 90 days, to be honest with you. Six months is a long time, but 
if the rest of the board's comfortable with the 60 or the six months up front, then every 90 days after, I could probably live with that. Um, I, I would prefer the 90 straight out, um, but but I'll, that 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 does satisfy, I guess me. The only other piece, though, I, I'm not, and I apologize that I didn't, Rick. I didn't, I didn't have uh, get real detailed with you on the personnel one today. So maybe we all need some time to think about that. I think when there's a change to personnel rules, just in general. Um, I believe that would normally come to the board. Am I am I right on that? If, in other words, if you just revamp the personnel rules, wouldn't that as a whole come back to the board for reauthorization or, or the, at least the portion that you revamp under normal circumstances, not under an emergency? This is Al Hendricks, attorney. I would think the way this is written, he, the executive director couldn't modify the personnel policies. It doesn't require that it come back to the board. That's interesting. Um, that's interesting because I know in the, I know in the city if I well yeah okay I, I, that would be interesting. I would want to. I think I would want to look at that a little more deeply before I would feel comfortable um, with that. If that if if that is in fact the case, uh, you know that executives have the ability to change personnel rules with no uh, no ratification by the legislative body, then. Then that would be news that I would want to want to consider further. I, I'm not confident today that that's the case. So that's that's one that would would I wouldn't be able to vote on today if, if, if we're not willing to take that out, that piece of it out, or have, come back for board ratification at the next board meeting. That I, I would be a no vote if we did that today. But if I guess if we, maybe we can look at it further, and uh, that might we might be able to come to a consensus on that too. So let me ask uh, how along those lines. Prior to the change, how was it? it? It was my understanding that the uh, chief executive officer could make personnel changes anyway, anyway, anyway. regardless of what we do today. The, the, this isn't changing right. that. Pursuant to the emergency. Yes. Okay. Pursuant to emergency. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's no emergency. You can't do that. Right. That comes back to the right. first. It has to be an emergency situation under the. In fact, when situations came up, we'd always go back and look at what the resolution said, and was this a part of the, the emergency or was it just ordinary operations of the agency? So, uh, and, yeah, 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 I can't tell Mayor. A quick question on that. So, um, when it comes to when the emergency powers have to be revamped, uh, I want to be really sensitive on how close together you put the stop signs. If you're in an emergency situation, um, yeah, you don't want them too close together. So I, I could probably support 180 days on that. On the personnel policies, uh, I think maybe we want to spend some time differentiating between what are temporary policies to meet specific um, situations such as employee uh, bonuses to keep it engaged or overtime and things like that. But, uh, I don't think we would want to grant the powers to make a permanent change on personnel policy in an emergency. And I don't know what that would look like. So we may need to think about that or talk that through a little bit more. Yeah. Actually, the way the current resolution is stated and this particular resolution is stated, it would be have to be pursuant to an emergency situation. So they, uh, these changes are not permanent, but it's only during the emergency. So by definition, they're not permanent. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let me ask this, uh, kind of goes to the crux of some of the issues we're dealing with. So the, the mandates that happened, some of these, I mean, were directed specifically from the state. I right. we, I, we could have a choice anyway. I, we had to do them within our cities and everything else. So I didn't, I don't know that subject to emergency power so much because it wasn't something the board could have said yay or nay to. Right, it was it was a state mandate. <clears throat> um, the vaccine mandate uh, was more of an emergency, correct? Right, right. And under, under the emergency power. Right, but did that come back to the board at any point? No. no. Okay. No. no, we we took that decision over a period of months through informal consultations, uh, through committee discussions, and eventually you know, I reported it um, in the board meeting. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's why this resolution formalizes the interactions between the, the executive and 
and staff and the board to make those kinds of decisions uh, more transparent. Yeah, so I think that goes to the crux of maybe some of the issues, which was the personnel. Uh, I think some of those things we did, we didn't, you had to do anything. Wouldn't have mattered what this said because they were state mandated. Um, some other ones, maybe it would have been good to come and discuss with the board before implementation if they weren't. Absolutely, we've got to do this, right? Emergency wise. I mean, so there's that that line. I don't think anybody wants to tie your hands. There's things you need to do. So maybe we do, maybe we can uh, discuss uh, the personnel what, you know, again, we want you to be able to do the things you absolutely have to do and not hold, hold you to that. Um, if I may, yeah, that was part of the reason for my initial uh, response to, to Mayor Neri's comments. I, I think when an emergency occurs, you know, whether it's a bridge collapse or an OZO landslide or a tsunami or a pandemic, uh, the need to act quickly uh, is apparent. And uh, in the case of the pandemic, uh, it was a public health emergency. And we needed to take a series of actions across the board to protect our employees and our customers. Um, some of those things related to personnel, um, you know, safety practices, uh, assignments, and in the case of compensation, premium pay, the, the ability to reward and recognize the efforts of personnel uh, in the face of a pandemic. So I, I you know, we're just having this discussion today, but I think it's really important uh, that the staff have the flexibility to respond to the circumstances that an emergency presents. And every emergency is going to be different, you know, and we don't know if we're going to have another pandemic. Uh, the recommendation that, that John and, and his team have made in 180 days plus 90 days thereafter is designed to give us the flexibility to respond uh, to an emergency while recognizing you know, that if we have an unusual circumstance uh, like a pandemic and it starts to drag out and it starts to get confusing, uh, that there's built in, you know, board oversight and engagement in what you do over the course of that extended period. Uh, so that's, that's the rationale for that recommendation. Uh, again, on the personnel policy side, I, I think you would be dealing with those issues in the regular reports and interactions between the staff and the board over the course of an emergency. I have to report monthly, and I have to justify continuing the emergency at 90 day intervals, and at 180, I need permission to continue. Councilor uh, Gondry. No, go ahead. Okay, um, Mayor Nering, I'm sorry, just saw his hand. Yeah, I think some of you have put real well, uh, Councilor Merrill and, and Mayor Marine and others, have put real well what my concerns are in that I, I, and I really think there is an ability under emergency authorization for a mayor, a count, county executive, CEO, whatever, to handle personnel policies that are emergent. Not questioning that. Um, but I think like, for instance, premium pay, that could easily come to the board. I, I know it came to many councils during this crisis. And then things like, you know, the elephant in the room, the vaccine mandate. And the problem we have there is that's gone from an emergency policy to almost a permanent policy now. I mean, if you look at what the governor is doing, it appears that state workers are now going to have to have vaccines and every available booster for the rest of their careers to work in state government. To me, that's a legislative body decision. It may very well be determined that that's the right decision by the majority of the legislative body. That's not something that a single person in my opinion, should make a decision on under our system of government. And so that's what I guess I'm concerned about when we have personnel policies made in an emergency that then start to cross over into permanent policies that affect a lot of people. Um, to me, that's where you need the legislative action to weigh in. Whether that's a, a ratification vote after the decision was made or simply bringing it to the board uh, before you even institute the policy, then I'm open to either one of those. But to just have policies made in emergency become semi-permanent uh, without any legislative way uh, of vote. And I think there's a big difference between an executive reporting back and a body having to vote on something. Um, that's a, there's a colossal difference in my mind between those two things. Um, when you have to vote on something, you study it very carefully, you come in prepared to ask a lot of questions, 
if it's just in a report, you don't even know the report's coming possibly until you get to the meeting. And, and again, it just doesn't have the same weight. So that would be my final thought there. Uh, thanks for Thanks for your thoughtfulness. I'm I'm pretty confident, you know, that 90 day thing, and he puts something together right away. So, you know, maybe if he and his staff had some time to consider this personnel policy thing, we could come up with something as well. I'm, my intention here is not to not to uh, uh, present this as a um, an, an issue that we're at odds with with the staff because pretty clearly the staff was able to come up with a really good option in a couple of hours this afternoon. So. And I apologize uh, if I'd had more time, maybe Rick and I could have gotten into this item as well this afternoon and we wouldn't have had to spend time here, but I think it's a healthy discussion anyway. So thanks. Thank you. Mayor and Aaron, um, yeah. So I, I think I also still agree with what he's saying there. Uh, what would the board like to do? That's what we're coming. I mean, uh, my, my, my gut again tells me that if in things like an emergency, you know, we get, Two feet of snow. We kind of have things in right. You know what to do. You, you, you deal with that. But um, premium pay, those again, we meet once a month, even if it's done virtually. There, there's probably not a lot of that they couldn't wait. It wasn't necessarily an emergency. Um, it can be brought. So that that's, I guess, my only. And I don't mind. I don't mind the six months and then every ninety days. I'm okay with that too. Uh, but I was just gonna. Uh, Define what I see. What I'm hearing the options are procedurally here. Um, you know, door number one is take up this resolution. Um, we did draft an amendment that I've described here uh, in response to Mary here in January, and we could move that and move on today, um, or you know, we could take it uh, back for further uh, review and further consideration and bring it back at the next board meeting. Uh, I'm comfortable either way. Um, I think the personnel policy issue uh, is addressed uh, in this resolution, especially as it would be amended, uh, because you'd be in a position of voting uh, on what's being proposed at that six month interval, and then again, there's 90 days thereafter. So I think that accountability is built into the approach we proposed. But I'll leave it obviously to the board's discussion whether we move forward or wait a month. So, point of clarification. We view that let's let's just put it on the line. We do 180 days that comes back to the board, and we can then the board decides to uh, extend it 90 days. Let's let's say we extend it 90 days, then we come back, and then we decided, okay, we we're not in an emergency anymore, so we rescind the emergency order, and we step back. Does that mean that all personnel policies that were put in place for the emergency are then rescinded? I'm going to maybe ask for some help from John here, but the, the emergency declaration um, would be made. And what I would be doing is uh, telling the board, I think we need to extend it and seeking concurrence. So that concurrence could be given in a blanket fashion, <laughs> caveats, uh, but I would <laughs> doing and why, and you would be deciding whether to allow me to proceed or proceed with direction. Okay. Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah. So uh, again, kind of the elephant in the room uh, on the vaccine policy, for example, we really never had a chance to discuss that. Um, and if the board had to make a decision on it, it certainly could have given you cover. Right, right, you kind of hang it out there. It's the Rick's decision, and, and and to this day, it's never come back to the board. It's just now policy, as as the mayor had said. So, I again, it just it's kind of stuck. So, how would it work with this new set? Would that something like that ever come back to the board, or once it's set in, it's set in stone? Back here, back to Dave. You mean under, what, under this policy, or or under the proposed amendment? It will. Yeah, yeah. Well, with the amendment, well, I'd leave it at that. Yeah, with the amendment, would it come back to the board and the board be able to decide you, on it? You could revoke the the emergency. Okay, and that was done in emergency, but is there a scenario that, that that's why? <laughs> is it ever perceived that that would come back to the board? That particular policy that was it was enacted 
in an emergency. Well, you can undeclare the, the emergency, not extend the emergency. That would be one way to deal with it. Okay. So I think that's 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 I think what Mayor Naring is his big concern is there's things put in place saying as emergency and then we're then they're stuck with it where there there's no way to unring that bell. So oh Councilor Schley said you know I realize when all of this happened that everyone was their minds weren't focused on a lot of stuff, but I remember distinctly setting not in a board meeting, but in committee meetings or on the phone or whatever with Rick before he came out with that mandate and discussed it with every one of Did he not discuss that with you guys? I mean, I remember setting in those meetings and I know for a fact that John was there. So he did, and, and there were people who were against it, but he did discuss it with the board, not in a board meeting, but in our committee meetings and on the phone and everything for quite some time before the decision was made. Well, but, and that's the point that Mayor Nairn's making is- He wants it voted on. Correct. There's a difference between being reported on and actually having a vote. Because um, you got to stand up in public and say, I, one way or the other, not, not behind closed doors discussing and being told what we did, and, but you don't, you know, this is what we're doing. Okay, that, that, that's the difference. But didn't we, we didn't, it didn't come to the full board and we voted on that at all. I, that I don't remember. No, it didn't. Well, I remember. There's the, plenty of discussion. <clears throat> yeah, I think we have plenty of discussion on it. Um, Could I make a recommendation? I, I really feel that, uh, I don't want to stymie discussion, but I would really feel that it would be best to take it back to uh, whatever committee it came from and uh, bring it back next uh, month because trying to do things on the fly, things get very complicated fast. So I would recommend that uh, there be a motion to uh, to uh, amend it back to committee. Yeah, yeah that's no, that's that, that's great. Again, and then since there's no rush to right. implement uh, it, unless there is a rush, I, but I'm not aware of any. Okay, so we move that we remand resolution number twelve twenty two back to committee. Is there a second? Second. All right, been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? All right. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, hearing that, uh, it passes again. Remind that back. So we have, um, okay, oh yeah, we still got a couple more items. The award of ITB 2022-055 vehicle storage and training facility construction to Greg Samateo. Samateo? Yeah. I've said um, it like, and every time I question myself. And it's exactly like it looks if you don't know how to pronounce the U. So Stamateo. Okay. So I'm Greg Stamateo. I am the Capital Development Program Manager here at Community Transit. I'm here today to present two uh, contracts for our facilities master plan. One uh, to hopefully take a project to construction and one to begin design on that. A quick reminder, the facilities master plan is a six phase program that will modernize our facilities and provide added flexibility and capacity ultimately and ultimately service for Snohomish County. A quick snapshot of where we're at with, with the program. Uh, facilities master plan one is this building here. We recently completed it on schedule and under budget. Facility Master Plan 2, uh, I brought that uh, project to the board recently this summer and has just begun construction. That is the renovation of the Merrill Creek Admin Building um, to provide that as a operations headquarters where our coach operators will report to and dispatch in the future. And that project will be completed late next year. Facilities Master Plan 3A, um, you may all remember we had groundbreaking approximately a year ago uh, on that today, was our expansion of our Merrill Creek operations base, specifically the garages and the shops. Um, that project is on schedule, a little bit behind schedule um, due to some structural steel delays, um, but is moving ahead well and we're just passing about the 40% completion. So the first project I am bringing to you today within the Facilities Master Plan is specifically a construction contract for the vehicle storage and training facility, also known as Facilities Master Plan Phase 5. Uh, this project will be uh, almost uh, directly across the street, uh, kitty corner to the site here, uh, northwest of the project, um, will be a uh, 
parking garage for storage of our fleet vehicles and also a training circuit um, to provide uh, an opportunity for our training team to um, complete CDL service and CDL licensing for our new coach operators. Um, this project will clear, grub, and grade the approximate 3.92 acres across the streets, provide asphalt uh, parking for vehicle storage, as I mentioned, and also uh, concrete paving for a training circuit. And also we'll be relocating two of the modular buildings at Merrill Creek Admin Base uh, over to this facility and reusing those for a remote training facility. The uh, project was originally bid in late April and we received only one single bid on that date of approximately $9 million. As this was significantly over the independent estimate our team created, that solicitation was canceled and rebid. This solicitation was rebid approximately six weeks later with no change of scope, I'd like to point out, um, on June 3rd, and we received three bids on that uh, occurrence from a range of approximately 7.8 million to approximately 8.9 million um, with the overall savings, as you can see, of approximately 1.22 million uh, with the six weeks additional process and getting additional bids. The independent estimate for this contract by our team was approximately 6.4 million. And after reviewing this process, our team has determined the favorite construction is the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. Although this is 21% approximately over the independent estimate, um, we are still considering this fair and reasonable due to two um, items. First, market conditions. So you may recall um, uh, Administrative Director Beardsley a few months ago presented to you on the status of the market conditions within the area and that our peer partners, including some of your own jurisdictions, are receiving bids at approximately 25% over independent estimates. So this is following that trend. And the second reason is that um, the bidders were all within a competitive range. So the market is dictating clearly that um, while we uh, anticipated a certain number, all the bid three bids were within a competitive range. This project is funded under project 2017 in the 2022 budget. And it is my team's recommendation um, that you do, the board authorizes this contract. And I'm available for any questions before we move on to the next. Thank you, Greg. Yes, Councilor Um, what, And I know all the construction things are up in the air. So do we have a timeline that they're saying, okay, we're gonna start, we might be finished, or is that gonna be just with the market? Uh, uh, timeline for the bidding volatility? No. Or, for, or just this specific project? Yeah, for just this specific project. Yeah, we have we have a, uh, a specified contractual term um, uh, of length in all of our contracts, including this one. Um, our original uh, construction term was to be completed, I believe right around Christmas time of, the, of this year, as we had a six week delay in the bidding process, it's gonna be extended so shortly into early next year. Oh, okay, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing nothing online. Okay. All right. Is there a motion? Chair, I move that the board of directors authorize the chief executive officer to execute a contract with Favor Construction Corporation for construction of FMP Phase Five Vehicle Storage and Training Facility for not to exceed amount of seven million seven hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars. All right. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All right, so move and second. It. Any discussion on the motion? All right, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that will pass unanimously. All right. Okay, I won't do the same introduction again. Uh, so this is a, also a contract for the facilities master plan. This is a design services contract specifically for facilities master plan. Uh, phase 3B, which will be the renovations of the Merrill Creek operations base. Um, I mentioned that we are in construction for 3A, which is everything generally west of the Great Hall. So the actual um, shops and uh, maintenance area itself. This is everything generally east of the Great Hall, which is the existing uh, location where our coach operators uh, report and dispatch from. We'll renovate this area after phase two is completed and the coach operators have moved over to the previous Merrill Creek admin building. Um, with this project, we'll renovate those office spaces for maintenance use and then also for uh, the training staff to continue to report to and train our, our coach operators and our other team members there. 
Um, with this process, we reviewed our qualified vendors list uh, for architectural and engineering services, interviewed multiple parties. I believe we interviewed four um, firms and chose KPFF consulting engineers as the most qualified based off of previous experiences and, and like projects. An independent government estimate uh, that was completed for about approximately $1.7 million. KPFF's original proposal was approximately $2.1 million. And through negotiations and adjustments of scope, a cost plus fixed fee task order has been negotiated uh, for approximately $1.7 million and is determined to be fair and reasonable. This contract will utilize a little over $97,000 of small business enterprise, which is approximately 5.6% of its usage. And this project is uh, also funded in the 2022 budget under project 2011. And it is my team's recommendation that uh, the board approves this, this design services contract for 100% design of the Merrill Creek operation space, also known as facilities master plan 3B. are also available for any questions. All right, thank you, Greg. Any questions? I am seeing none. So excellent, excellent job. How about a motion? I move that the board of directors authorize chief executive officer to execute task order with KPFF consulting engineers for a not to exceed amount of one million seven hundred thirty-five thousand two hundred two dollars and ninety-six cents for one hundred percent design of the Merrill Creek maintenance building improvements project under the facilities master plan phase three Bravo. All right. Is there a second? Second. Sorry, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that will pass you out of sleep. Uh, thank you very much. And with that, uh, let's see. My report. Uh, All right, as of the 3 p.m. Uh, July 21st, our, we have a board workshop, just to remind everybody of that. It's gonna be replaced with a public hearing on free youth transit passes. So kind of a more discussion on what we talked about today. The meeting duration should be short, there'll be no action. Uh, if you would like to attend via Zoom, you certainly can. And uh, we would rather you be on site. It's always best if you can, but if you, if you need to. Um, is that basically what, no? At least one person has to be on the site. So I would, it would look better if there were more than one. Yeah, I, and I, what's really, and I thank you for moving closer to my city hall. It's pretty easy for me to be on, yes. on site, which is nice. I, if I'm here by Zoom, I'm out of town. That's probably the case. You can't have a total Zoom, Zoom meeting. meeting. Okay. You have to have somebody here. Yeah, okay, we will make sure that happens. Cool. All right. Can I, can I ask something? Absolutely. Okay. Well, because I brought this up when I first got here today, because the finance committee meets at two o'clock that same day before. And if we were going to be in person for the board meeting, then we definitely need to be in person for the finance committee, because yeah. there's no way we can travel yeah, right. in that 10 minutes, you know. Yeah. So if we're just going to do a public hearing on the youth fair. And if you're here in person and the rest of us are on Zoom, does that work for us? That's legal. You have to have a specific place under the, under the new law that was just passed. You can't have a total Zoom meeting. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, if you, if you decide you would like to stay home and do both meetings by Zoom, you can. I assume if somebody wanted to come and do the finance committee meeting, they could do that here as well. Yes, so yeah, I know. either way, yeah. right? You don't want to do one one way or the other, okay? But the board meeting is just going to be a public hearing, is that right? Okay, okay. thank you, okay? Um, and as with all public meetings, as we talked about, the, the public may attend in person or remotely, they we, we, do, we do not force them to come in person, <laughs> they don't need to. And our next uh, regular board meeting is scheduled for August the 4th at three o'clock. I will be out of town, so I know I will not be here at that particular meeting. Um, so putting whatever on the agenda, if you think you can get something by me, that's probably the time. <laughs> and I doubt I will be doing it remotely. So um, with that, what else we got? Uh, board communication, any board members have? Uh, Councilman Merrill, let's start there. Let's work down the line. You're good? Councilman, everybody? Yeah, I'm good. You're good? Council Member Anatri? 
Yeah, thank you. Just one final thing when you mentioned that, Mayor Marine, um, I'll also be out of town and unable to attend the August board meeting. If that previous item we discussed could be moved to September, I would appreciate it. Uh, so we could have August is a tough month, I'm sure, for some. And if we could have that way, we could have a full board to, to um, debate and, and uh, come up with a decision on that. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Fazell? Uh, yes, I will be available. Uh, Council Member Nairn? Uh, no update, and I'm just filling in today, so I'll check with Council Member Wright, Council Member Mead, and see if, uh, see if I need to be at the next one. Thank you. All right, Council Member Mead, anything you've got for us? Uh, no, nothing for me, and I'll be available as well. Uh, Council Member Gallagher? Nothing this evening. I didn't uh, space bar like he's supposed to. All right, Labor Representative Norton. Uh, I have nothing. I just can't believe I haven't spoken for two hours and 20 minutes. Uh, my wife used to say I talk too much. <laughs> Obviously, I don't. Thank you. We were checking in. We were getting very concerned. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we, uh, we don't have an executive second. No, we don't. Okay. Any other business? Uh, we're adjourned. Bye. Right.